Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maor and I will be, will be the session for the, uh, the, this chair, the chair for this session. Uh, okay, this session. Okay, this session, this is the second session about spectroscopy and microscopy titled Magnetic Resonance. Uh, it will work exactly the same as the previous one. We're going to have hopefully two uh, presentations. A 15 minute talk and uh, five minutes for questions. Uh, and the question will work exactly the same. You can write out either in the chat or use the raise hand feature at the end of uh, the talk, each talk. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, okay. So our first spe speaker of this session uh, is Asias Svirinovsky Arbeli. Uh, Asia is a PhD student in uh, Dr. Michal Laskes, uh, Laskes group from the Weizmann Institute. And uh, just a small thing about Asia, she, uh, two years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, she was in the organizing committee of this conference. And uh, at least for me, I, I will remember her for handing me the, my first best speaker award. So for that, she will always be remembered. You, will, you were well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Asia, the floor is yours. Good luck. Okay, Maor, thank you for this kind introduction. So uh, my name is Asia, and today, hopefully, uh, I can uh, show you how we can monitor dendrite growth in composite electrolytes using solid state and MR. So uh, lithium ion batteries dominate the way that we power our gadgets, our portable gadgets this day. In order to expand its usage to large scale application as um, grid storage and transportation, we have to have lithium batteries with higher energy density. So uh, in general, lithium ion batteries composed of two electrodes with different uh, potential between them. The lithium ions shuttle back and forth in the uh, Sorry, my presentation was off. Yeah. The, the lithium ions shuttle back and forth um, in the liquid electrolyte, releasing electrons to the circuit and powering your um, device. Currently, uh, the anode that's used is based on graphite, which has limited capacity. In order to increase the energy density in uh, the cell, um, one of the most efficient way to do that today is to switch to lithium uh, metal anode, which stores 10 times more lithium than uh, graphite. However, lithium metal has some problems. During charging, lithium can deposit, lithium can deposit irregularly on the anode side, um, forming uh, sparkly um, structures, as you can see here, which cause dendrites. And it's continue growing and it can may reach the other electrode and cause a short circuit. And of course, in the presence of flammable uh, uh, liquid electrolyte, your cell can explode and you don't want your vehicle to explode. So in the recent years, uh, there was a lot of uh, efforts to uh, fix that. And one of the way to do that is switch your liquid electrolyte to solid state electrolytes. So there are a lot of families of solid electrolytes. Uh, this is only three of them. You have the polymer one, which is uh, basically uh, used in used polyethylene oxide. You have crystalline one that based on ceramics. And one of the promising one is LLZO, lithium, aluminum, lanthanum, zirconium oxide. And the combination of both of them is the ceramic particles um, embedded in polymer lithium matrix. So I will uh, today concentrate on the composite uh, structure. So as I told you, the most uh, important advantage of composite uh, electrolyte that it's safe, it's non-flammable, it has higher energy density. However, we still have the problem of dendrites. Dendrites are, dendrites are still grow, and you need to understand that it is lithium metal that can react with all the uh, with most of the uh, ingredients of the composite and. Um, and form passive link layer that also call also no solid electrolyte interface. So we need to have we still need uh, to tackle the problem of dendrites. And in order to control them, we have to characterize them. And especially we need to answer the question through which part of the composite these dendrites grow and propagate. 
if it's from the ceramic part, the polymer part, maybe both of them. And can we grow some SCI that can passivate the dendrites to continue propagating and shortcut our sample? However, characterization of these uh, dendrites are really challenging. There are thin metallic wires in heterogeneous composite that are very reactive and you cannot expose them to air. So today I'm going to present you how we can do that using solid state NMR. So solid state NMR is an excellent analytic tool to study the materials. In principle, you can detect most of the uh, elements in the periodic table uh, highlighted in color. It's very sensitive to chemical environment. It can give you rich information about structure and you can follow dynamics. And especially it's very useful in the uh, research in lithium batteries because lithium has two NMR active isotopes, lithium seven, which is more abundant and lithium self uh, six, that's it's much more result. So how we prepared our samples, we synthesized the LLZO, we mix it with the polymer and the lithium salt, PEO and lithium TFSI, we cast the mixture and dried it. This is a, a schematic representation, how it looks like, it's the uh, polymer matrix here and the LLZO embedded in them. And this is how it practically looked like, it's very flexible and robust. And then we took, uh, we wanted to, uh, to evaluate the electrochemical performance. You can see here how it looked like. It's a symmetrical cell. There are two lithium uh, that's sandwiching your composite here in, uh, in, uh, in pink. Typically in a symmetrical cell, lithium versus uh, lithium, you can get a potential, you, you, need, you will get a potential of zero. And however, in the presence of composite and interfaces in, within them, you can read some voltage, which is your over potential. And a good uh, composite will give really low over potential, close to zero. So we apply the current density of 50 microamps uh, per centimeter square, squared, and this is how our uh, electrochemical uh, performance look like. It's very nice. It lasts for long. It doesn't shortcut. For example, as here, this is uh, as we started to cycle it. Probably one of the dendrites touched the other electrode and short circuit our cell. So. Then we took our sample uh, to NMR, we disassembled it. We need to extract the composite from the lithiums and we packed it in the rotor, which is the sample holder for NMR in a glove box, of course. And we took a lithium six NMR spectrum three hours after the, uh, this assembly. This is how, uh, this is once again, the representative of our cell. And you can see here, we clearly can see the lithium TFSI, the LLZO uh, peak, and lithium metal, which is our dendrites. Um, and we took, we took another measurement of the same sample after one month, and we can see how the uh, dendrite signal uh, dropped significantly, significantly. So we can say that we can, uh, uh, solid state NMR allow us to detect and uh, monitor the dendrites and their modification transformation. Here is degradation. Um, and as I told you, we also have the SCI that cover them. So can we see that? Uh, yes, we can. We observe the new phase form on this, uh, that form, that their formation and disappearance is correlated to the formation degradation of the dendrites. So we can deduce that probably it grow on the dendrite. And from chemical shift, we know that it's lithium hydroxide. And what is the... Uh, but however, we still have no information about what is the growing uh, growth path of uh, this dendrite? What is the weak point in our composite as a dope PO uh, interface between them? So we need how, somehow selectively probe the only environments that are close to the dendrite and not the whole picture uh, as we can see here in solid state NMR. So how we can do that? We will use a dynamic nuclear polarization. In the recent years, it uh, used it's very um, common technique to uh, boost the sensitivity on NMR. We're using electron spin polarization, which its magnetic moment is much larger than the nuclear one. And we're transferring this polarization, which proportional to the signal which you can see in NMR from the electrons to the nuclear. How you practically do, do that? You have your sample with a nuclear that you want to detect. You need electron unpaired electron spin, electron spin polarization. You add it as a solution of a, a radicals in your sample. You radiate with microwave the transitions of the, the electrons and the polarization transfer from the electron uh, through the solution 
to your nucleus enhancing uh, his uh, signal. As you can see here, this is a mesopole silica without any, uh, without in regular NMR, you cannot see the spectrum is silent. As you turn the microwave on and apply DMP, the, um, you can see a variety of peaks that are explaining your um, material. However, we cannot use in a electrochemical cell a solution of radicals because they are very reactive, they are very bulky structure, and it can uh, make transformation to your uh, cell. However, why we need to use that? We have internal spin polarization inside our batteries. We have the dendrites, which contain lithium metal. Inside them, we have the conduction electrons that we can use in, as unpaired electrons. And the mechanism that describes this is called over uh, Hauser mechanism. You have, uh, it's a characteristic to system with fast dynamics as is liquids and metals. You have one electron and one nuclei coupled between them. Um, yeah, as you can see here, it can describe by four uh, energy levels uh, uh, diagram. You continuously radiate uh, the EPR transition, the electron-electron transition, and, um, and it induces uh, relaxation processes. And you can see here uh, transitions that can give you a, 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 um, NMR enhancement, the DMP enhancement as well. And how you practically verify if you have uh, this uh, DN overhouse DMP in your system. So you irradiate different points in your spectrum of the EPR, as you can see here. And then you record NMR uh, in each of these points. You integrate them and you plot the intensity as you can see here. So your radiation exactly on the EPR transition of the uh, conduction electron will give you the maximum enhancement and going off a little bit uh, left and right, you can see a decrease of the enhancement. So we would like to uh, use this uh, approach. And we can see here, this is the dendrites inside our cell. We want to uh, irradiate with microwave and the polarization will transfer from the conduction electrons to the uh, environments just close to the uh, conduction to the dendrites. And by that, we will highlight only the environment close to the dendrites with the microwave on. So let's, let's see if we can do that. Um, so this is a microwave off of our cell of lithium-7. As we uh, um, turn the microwave on, we can see signal enhancement of the dendrites by a factor of four. And, and we can verify that it, it is an uh, overhouser DMP because the radiation or on the EPR transition give this characteristic uh, nice um, uh, line shape. And surprisingly, what we also saw that the LLZ dose signal here was also enhanced. Uh, it's probably implying the dendrite growth was through LLZ dose because with the microwave on, we see that this signal is enhanced. The next question, can we transfer polarization to other nuclei? For example, phases with uh, different nuclei of the composite, protons, carbons. So with that, we use uh, uh, this uh, model system. We enrich our battery with lithium-6, uh, we use lithium-6 metal. So now our dendrites are enriched with lithium-6, uh, mostly lithium-6. So you can see here we have, uh, uh, with microwave oven, we have enhancement of the uh, metal and the LLZ dough, as we saw. And now if we look at lithium-7, you can see here, this is uh, exactly radiation on the um, uh, EPR transition. And if we going uh, off that we're supposed to be here in this screen, we can see that there is negligible uh, um, Negligible uh, difference between the intensities, so probably we don't have the we don't have the DNP effect. So probably polarization is transferred just between the same nuclei. This is very interesting and new in the field of the Overhauser DNP, and it's still under investigation. And if we have so, such a good uh, resolution, can we uh, see what's happening on the? We if we can see the SCI grown the dendrites. So yes, we do. <laughs> we see that uh, the lithium dioxide that is going on the uh, dendrites is enhanced selectively, selectively, and it's it's very uh, it's very amazing for me at least. Uh, so to summarize, I hope that I convince you that uh, using solid state and MR we can monitor and detect dendrites formation and degradation. We can use overhouse DMP to selectively probe only the environment close to the dendrites itself. Uh, 
heteronuclear polarization between different uh, L, um, nuclei is understudied yet, but probably it's conduit. And theory also supports that. And the results uh, imply that the dendrites grow from the LSD dome. And with that, I would like to thank all my group, especially my supervisor, Dr. Michal Eskes, and Yuda Buganin, which made uh, some of these uh, experiments and all other, and the funding. And come to see, uh, if you want more, come to see the flush talk of Hen Oppenheim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asa, for this interesting talk. Uh, anyone has any question? questions? Questions? Uh, I have one question if nobody else does. Um, first of all, great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious as to what, uh, what limits uh, the DNP from enhancing the signal even further. Like you said that it enhances it four times. Why couldn't it be six, eight, 10, 15? Um, 18, so, um, so, uh, 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 I will come back here. The, uh, the, this is what I'm talking about. So the polarization, tra uh, the polarization transfer um, from the conduction electrons, uh, most of the overhauser DNP on the solids uh, show this, but like particularly uh, low enhancement, but here we are not looking for enhancement. We are looking for selectively uh, see the, um, we selectively see all the environments that close to this, uh, um, to this, to these dendrites. So we don't go for the big numbers. We want just to see the environments that uh, um, go, go like, well, that in micro one with we see that they enhance. And the polarization transfer for the overhouse is very, very, um, um, it's very, very uh, hard to, to, to get. You need, uh, it's based on, uh, it's if you are going uh, uh, deep to the, to, to the theory is based on cross relaxation. The relaxation process is going back to equilibrium between the electron and nuclei that are, need to be in the exact uh, time scale. So it, it's really, really hard to do that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you. Okay, so Isaac, you, you, you asked exactly the same question I thought of asking. So <laughs> I'll just come up with another one. So, so at, at one of your first slides, you showed that after a month, the signal from the dendrites are getting lower, right? Something like that? that they, yeah, they... It's, the same, it's the same same sample. I just kept it. We just, uh, Yuda Buganim did this, um, and this experiment. He just kept it like in the glove box, uh, the same rotor that he, uh, that he measured. And he took another like measurement. So, so the dendrites degrade after a month? Yeah, that they grade because they, they uh, react with the composite uh, uh, structures. And if we zoom, if I will zoom here in, you can see that we have another phases that probably grow, like consume this lithium uh, metal and grew here. So, so does this mean that the performance of the battery would be better if I won't use it for a month? <laughs> probably. Yeah, but it's not practical, yeah. Because okay. we need, like, for our vehicles, we need uh, we need long-lasting, uh, robust uh, batteries. Okay, yeah. I got it. Okay, so I said thank you very much. Thank you, thank uh, you for having me. Sure. I will so, stop it. Uh, yeah. Sure. Thanks. So uh, our next and last speaker for this session will be Nir Dayan. Here is a PhD student in the group of uh, Professor Aaron Blanc from the Technion. Uh, so Nir, you can share your screen and good luck. Thanks. Sure. Yes, okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, so as uh, Mo said, uh, I'm doing my uh, PhD at uh, Technion at the uh, Faculty of Chemistry. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, some of the research uh, I did up till now. Um, so um, obviously I didn't do everything alone. Uh, I have to thank uh, my advisor, the lab members and the support staff, and of course uh, the collaborators. And um, 
much of the um, work was done at the clean rooms at the Technion uh, Micro Nano Fabrication and Printing Unit. Okay, so I think uh, you saw this at the Asia's uh, lecture, but um, okay, so EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. We study unpaired electrons and uh, the, when the electron is in the magnetic field, we have the Zeeman splitting and we radiate uh, this um, delta E with uh, microwave energy so we can get a spectrum. So what is this good for? Some applications, we can use a solid, liquid or gas samples and we can study um, EPR uh, at uh, the fields of chemistry, biology, physics and many more. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, we can study stable radicals and radicals that are formed during chemical reactions. Um, we can study transition metals such as uh, iron uh, two plus, and also these uh, um, metals when they are inside the complexes, such as uh, metalloenzymes. Um, so EPR, most of my work was done uh, towards uh, structural biology uh, applications, and usually um, biological molecules are uh, diamagnetic, so we have to tag them with some kind of uh, radicals to see them in EPR. So we can tag them with one radical and study it, or um, if we tag it with two radicals, we can uh, measure the distance between the radicals. And uh, with the current method, uh, we can measure up to 70 nanometers between them. And then we get some kind of um, uh, distance distribution. And it helps us solve uh, the structures of the molecules. Okay, so uh, the EPR resonator, it's the heart of the system. Uh, actually, it's a small box that uh, is around uh, one millimeter to one centimeter. And the role of this uh, box is to focus the microwave uh, magnetic fields on the sample. Um, and this is how we increase the measurement sensitivity. Um, so what uh, samples usually we can measure it's uh, liquids around uh, one milliliter and uh, if we want to measure single crystals it's they have to be bigger than uh, one one millimeter um, so if we want to study samples that are smaller like um, micro crystals or uh, sub nanoliter liquid samples what we need to do is increase the sensitivity so in our lab this is uh, what we did and i'm going to tell you uh, the the basic principles. So um, this formula um, says that the signal to noise ratio um, is dependent on these uh, parameters. So if we have some uh, sample uh, that has a limited spin concentration and limited volume, so we can't make the sample smaller, but we can increase the sensitivity of our system. And we do that by increasing the quality factor of our um, of our resonators and decreasing the size of the resonator. Um, so we don't actually have to increase the, the, the actual size of the resonator, but just uh, the effective, effective uh, place where the magnetic field is uh, concentrated at. Okay, so this is um, uh, the resonators that we are using in our lab. We call them Parpa resonators because they look like a butterfly in Hebrew. Um, and so we have uh, absolute spin sensitivity, which is uh, fourfold better than the conventional cavity resonators I showed before, um, that you usually, maybe you have them in your uh, university. Um, so in the surface resonators, what we do is we, um, like I said, we put all of the magnetic field in this antenna shaped uh, structure and it 
it concentrates the magnetic field in this uh, small red uh, place, which is uh, say around 100 micrometer. And we can control actually uh, changing the, the shape of this, uh, of this uh, palpar. We can control uh, the size of the sample. It can be 10 micrometer or uh, 20 or 50 or 100, even uh, one micrometer. And we can also adjust the frequency. So this specific palpar is for a Q band, which is around 35 gigahertz. We can also make it for X band, um, which is uh, around uh, 12 gigahertz. Um, so how did we manufacture it? In the clean rooms, we just uh, took some uh, dielectric substrate which is a uh, lanthanum aluminum oxide in this, uh, in this case, and we uh, do photolithography with uh, copper. It's a very thin layer of copper around uh, um, half a micron. Now I'm gonna show some results. So in the picture, we see um, a close up of the resonator with uh, some microcrystal on it and um, well the reason uh, we did these measurements is because uh, some some uh, samples of uh, interest uh, you want to measure their single crystal uh, spectra and it gives you a lot of information about the electronic structure of the molecule um, but you can't grow them over uh, say uh, 50 microns so you can't measure them in the conventional EPL. Um, so we took this uh, biomolecule uh, model, which is composed of uh, copper and nickel, and we were able to measure uh, its uh, EPR spectrum. So here I show you, we measured it at uh, room temperature in blue and uh, in 50 Kelvin uh, in red, and we are comparing it to the simulations and we see it's a good fit. What we see in the red, uh, in the asterisk, is um, some impurities that come from our substrate, the dielectric lanthanum oxide. And uh, this, is, um, this is a bit of a problem when we go to low temperatures, because the actual substrate has some spin radicals that um, are uh, in the way of our measurements. Um, the way that we solve this, um, we can do replace the substrate with a silicon substrate, and then we have less impurities, and it's uh, easier to do low temperature measurements. Okay, another um, application is the microfluidic EPR. Um, here we took the resonators and we put the microfluidic channels on them. And we can also put some kind of um, grid that has a very small pores if we want. Uh, and then we took uh, this radical, um, this stable radical, and we measured uh, a liquid sample volume of uh, 250 picoliters at room temperature. Uh, the concentration of one uh, millimolar, and we can, it has the sensitivity to measure also uh, 500 nanomolars. Another application um, is uh, diffusion measurements. If we take the system that I show and we add um, the gradient coil, here, this is a copper coil. So we can actually um, use this coil to deliver uh, pulsed magnetic field gradients. And um, uh, what does it mean gradients? It means that there's a high, say there's a high magnetic field here and a low magnetic field here. So there's actually um, a spatial difference uh, of magnetic fields that the sample feels. And if you remember for the, from the first slide, it means that the energy levels there are different and they have different frequencies. And 
it's kind of similar to the coarse magnetic field gradients they're, they're using MRI. So uh, because we have a small sample and small resonator, we can deliver a huge gradient and we can do them at a fast uh, time, one microseconds. And that allows us to measure very, very small um, distances of diffusion that are around uh, 50 nanometers. Um, it's this uh, pulse program called the uh, Pulse Gradient Spin Echo. I'm not going to get into it. But uh, basically, we are. Um, uh, this is the measurement. We perform, we apply some gradient, we measure our signal, and then we apply a bigger and bigger. And uh, from this, we can extract the diffusion coefficient. Okay, so this is uh, some of the, the work we did. We also, we have uh, um, some more uh, ideas we thought about um, in our future prospects. So we have, uh, we can use, uh, instead of copper, we can use a superconducting metal to, to fabricate my resonators. And then maybe um, we can measure smaller crystals, maybe around one micron, maybe in the future nanocrystals. Um, and, uh, but for this, we have to reach the critical temperature of the superconducting metal, which is usually lower than 80 Kelvin, at least in the case of the metals we work with. Um, in the microfluidic uh, area, so we can use it for more um, re real life applications um, to combine ESR with uh, some uh, uh, monitoring of reactions. Um, or measure a single cell um, ESR or single microorganism such as uh, uh, nematodes. Um, okay, and what, what I showed you with the diffusion setup, there we measure the actual real diffusion of the liquid. And if we freeze uh, our samples, we can measure also the quantum uh, spin diffusion which is the diffusion of the spins, how they are uh, moving through space. And from this, um, we, can, uh, we can use it uh, to make a measurement of uh, the spin-spin distance, like I showed you in the beginning on uh, biological molecules that are uh, between uh, 20 and 50 nanometers. If you have uh, two spins that are, the distance between them is 20 to 50 nanometers. And then um, uh, this actually is a big difference. Uh, it's an extension of the, the current method that can only reach uh, around 17 nanometer if you want to measure uh, the spin-spin distance. Um, okay, so, uh, and the last thing is that we have we have all these uh, new methods and uh, <laughs> we're looking for interesting samples to measure. Um, Maybe you have some interesting samples that you want to measure, such as microcrystals or uh, uh, sub nanoliter uh, paramagnetic uh, samples. So you can contact me or the lab. And um, so you can learn uh, about more about EPR in general from the YouTube lectures or books. And there's a nice lecture I put here that if you are, uh, if you know NMR, then uh, it's uh, suited for people who know NMR to learn the basics of uh, EPR more easily. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Neil, for the interesting talk. Uh, we're not a lot of people, but uh, does anyone have any, has any question? I have a question. You said you, you used copper with lant lanthanide aluminum oxide, right? Yes. Somewhere in the middle. So I wanted to ask why why to use lanthanum aluminum aluminum oxide. Just um, why. It's a dielectric substrate, and actually, what we do is we know the uh, dielectric constant constants of materials, and 
uh, this uh, substance has a good uh, dielectric uh, constant and we try to calculate it to see if we can reach the resonance that we want. We want it around 35 uh, gigahertz. Mm -hmm. um, if we use something else, it can be too high or too low because the frequency range that we can use in us in our device is uh, between uh, 32 and 36 and a half. Um, there are other substrates we can use. But this okay. is uh, what we chose. Okay, thank you. So I would also ask another question here. So you show that you use this uh, this butterf butterfly configurations configuration for for, uh, for micro crystals. So what exactly limits you in far, as, as far as the crystal size uh, goes? Like you can create this butterfly, like the tunnel between the butterflies are even even narrower. Maybe I don't know. Go to nano crystals and stuff like that. So. So why are the limit limited to this time? Yeah, so there's the fabrication part where uh, our resolution here is around, uh, um, I would say one micrometer. Um, and it's also more difficult because say I try to make a uh, hundred resonators and I only get uh, two that are good because uh, the rest of them had dust right <laughs> where I wanted to make the bridge. Um, and it's, uh, it's more challenging. It's more challenging to couple my resonator to my uh, device um, because um, as I showed here, this location of the, of the resonator in respect to my uh, system it's very crucial and it's a very, it's one of the most difficult parts of the experiments. So we can, uh, if I try to irradiate with say 35 gigas, that it actually reaches the resonator and it's very, so sometimes the resonator, the little bridge there, it has to be really aligned. Um, Yeah, that's pretty much our problems. So with the superconducting, we can stay at the same um, sizes, but uh, we get higher sensitivity. So you would say it's more of a of a practical limitation and not a theoretical one. Like in theory, you can make this narrower. And yeah, also in theory, I can go and try changing this power shape to something else. And maybe it will give me way more, but um, this is like an infinite uh, amount of possibilities that we have to check. Uh, so we keep uh, trying to uh, make it better just a little bit at a time. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so again, thank you for your talk. And thank you for also for Asia uh, for giving the talk, uh, the previous talk in the session. So we're gonna have a 10 minute break. At 2.20, we're gonna start our uh, uh, flash talk session, so you're all welcome to join. Uh, so thank you very much, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you.